Hello. We're here to talk about the very fast moving uh, landscape of electric vehicles and electric vehicle charging. I'm here with Pasquale Romano, and in many ways, we're at a tipping point in the electric vehicle revolution. We've seen over the past 10 years, we've seen the business start up and uh, grow, and now we're seeing a lot of deployment, even from the big companies. So why don't we start there, Pasquale? Do you see this year as a tipping point moving into 2020? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest driver, no pun intended, for, for it being a tipping point is the availability of choice for a consumer to buy cars they actually like. Uh, up to very recently, there was very limited model availability uh, from auto OEMs, and then even within those model segments, they weren't available in all geographies. So right here in Portugal, there were probably very few choices relative to, say, California uh, and maybe some other places in even Europe. Even the availability of SUVs that you could plug in, and the, the American marketplace, for instance, is very into SUV these days, but now we're seeing a lot of deployment of plug-in SUVs. Yeah, half, half the U.S. market is trucks and SUVs, a little less than half. So without an SUV, half the market's not available. Right. So do you think we're reaching the point where electric vehicles will become the dominant form of transportation? Right now, it seems to be moving a little faster in China than it is in the U.S. and in Europe, but it is moving everywhere. Yeah, it's moving everywhere. I mean, I think one interesting statistic that I, I point out when I'm in talks like this is um, it, let's take the U.S. market just as an example. It's proportional in Europe. Um, there's 15 to 17 million cars a year sold. Um, that probably will decline as more rides go to ride sharing, but let's just use that as a figure. And there's about a quarter billion cars and light duty trucks on U.S. roads. So if 100% of new car sales tomorrow were electric, it would probably take somewhere upwards of 16 years or so to convert the whole fleet. Now, it will probably go faster in the later years and slower in the earlier years because 100% of you know, 100% of car sales it's aren't growing electric. faster in like pockets like California yeah. is the center. Like 50% of all electric vehicles have been deployed there, as I understand it, and but it's approaching 5% of the market there. Right? 5% of sales. 5% of sales. Sales, not the uh, install base. And what's interesting, just to give you kind of like a preview of what it's like to live in an environment like that, in Silicon Valley, if you were to show up at a party in your brand new, you know, high-end luxury gas-burning vehicle, you'd be socially ostracized. Um, so it's, 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 become, it's become more, it, it's become unfashionable to spend a lot of money in damage Or, or for celebrities arriving at the Oscars in like a Hummer or something would be bad. Yeah, that right now, no, that wouldn't go over. <laughs> you don't want to do that. So, and I understand it's in Silicon Valley at workplaces also, where you have high concentrations of electric vehicles, there aren't, there isn't enough charging for them, so they have to stagger it through the day. Isn't that been happening? Um, a little bit. I mean, you know, it's it's uh, charge. Another misconception is you don't build out the charging infrastructure, assuming 100% of cars will be electric overnight. So the infrastructure sort of follows the demand, especially in parking lots that are long duration parking, like workplaces. But an interesting, you know, stat for the crowd is in the U.S., and it doesn't matter whether it's California or anywhere else, if you have workplace charging, you're six times more likely to buy an electric vehicle. They have about six times the penetration the minute an employer puts in EV charging, which says the consumer cares about that the most because if you look at, and, and I think the previous gentleman uh, had that stat up, 4% utilized vehicle, 96% of the time, it's like your cat. It just lies around and sleeps. So where is it sleeping most of the time? It's at home or at work. So the minute you give someone charging at work, you enable them to buy an EV. Sure. People often say, uh, if I'm going to buy an electric car, I worry about whether I'll be able to charge it. That seems to be going away as the public charging network grows. And uh, ChargePoint has been growing a lot. You've absorbed other companies. How many chargers do you have around the world? Not just in the U.S., but in It's about 60,000 around the world and growing, you know, really fast. And you're in most of the countries in Europe now? Yeah, we're in about uh, 17 or 18 countries. We'll, you know, we're targeting, uh, you know, the entire EU uh, as soon as we possibly can. Um, to give you a reference, um, our uh, MD for Europe celebrated his one-year anniversary with ChargePoint yesterday. Uh, he's out there. Hi, Chris. Uh, and 
uh, we started from essentially zero infrastructure in Europe, and within a year we've got uh, you know over 50 people spread out among all the countries in Europe. So, I was talking to an uh, executive at Aston Martin yesterday, and they're coming out with an electric car that will have 800 volt charging capacity. Uh, I thought the big availability issue with that would be, will we have chargers that can do 800 volts? So our fast chargers that we're deploying now already can. They go 200 to 1,000 volts. Well, what kind yeah. of charging time are we talking about with 800 volts? So 800 volts drops the current required to, so you can put double the energy in at, uh -huh. uh, you know, essentially the same current, uh, which is where all the losses are into heat. So if you, uh, you know, use 400 kilowatts as a number, uh, four to 500 is going to be the limit of the combo connector that's, that's the standard for Europe and U.S. Uh, fast chargers. Uh, you're talking um, about uh, 250 kilometers in about 10 minutes. <laughs> so there, now we're talking about tipping points. Right. When it can actually be faster to charge your car than to put gas in it. That's a, that's a major tipping point. And while we're talking about tipping points, let's talk about the Tesla Model 3 a little bit. Because the introduction of that car has set all kinds of records, where it's become like the best-selling car by some measures, if, depending on how you look at by it. By many measures. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, when we talk about it being the best available choice across all segments, or you look at it as a luxury car or a performance car, different ways of looking at it, it's still like the best-selling car. No other car had 400,000 advance orders that I'm aware of. So that's, I think, where we talk about we're really moving towards an electric world. Yeah, but I think Tesla had, there's some interesting, notable things that they did so well. Number one, they vertically integrated into battery, and it's the highest, if you look at, um, car companies, look at their names, Bavarian Motor Works, General Motors Corporation, right? I mean, yeah. they all have motor, or a lot of them have <laughs> Ford Motor Company, yeah. right? And the reason is, when they started 100 years ago, they built motors. They vertically integrated around what was the differentiation. Well, the differentiation in an electric vehicle, since the motor is a relatively simple thing, is the battery technology. And that vertical integration has enabled them to achieve some pre pretty amazing things. Tesla built its own fast charging network, the supercharger network, mm -hmm. but it isn't compatible with other cars. Uh, Elon Musk once showed me the, char the standard charging cable. He said it wasn't elegant and he was going to design his own, which he did. But is that the wrong approach, do you think? Do you think it should all be integrated so everybody can charge everywhere? Well, I mean, I think eventually, yeah, because there's, there's just, um, in the limit, you can't have every auto OEM decide that they want to do something different. There just isn't enough real estate or utilization to make that business model work at scale for a third party to do that. I will say that if I were Tesla, I probably would have done the same thing in building out a charging network when they did, because they were highly dependent on that and the rest of the world was just not getting getting off the blocks fast enough to do that um, and so now that they've uh, proven that if you take away that buying objection you can have generally a very uh, you know high demand car I mean I think the Model 3 was uh, the fourth best-selling car uh, in the world uh, you know last month so if you look at that penetration that's pretty mass market as vehicles go, so they've proven that that's a necessary objection to remove. You think we're moving fast enough with public infrastructure for electric cars? You think we should be moving faster? Um, I don't know, the last I looked, um, I think there was almost 10,000 public chargers in the US, if I got that right. Um, and in Europe, we're probably, I don't, I don't know the number for Europe, but uh, are we moving fast enough? Well, I mean, I think for I think public charging is, is an overloaded term. Um, what you're not going to do as an electric vehicle driver is drive around until the little yellow light comes on and go someplace to recharge your vehicle. Tesla's proven that. Our drivers on our network prove that. You're going to recharge largely at work or home, both, pla both of those places, because that's where your car is. So, and that workplace infrastructure we see in North America and, and increasingly in Europe now that we're uh, marketing largely, to, not largely, but uh, heavily to workplaces, 
is that as you uh, have more EVs in your workplace parking lot, you need to provide the charging infrastructure. And if you do that, you can build it at a matched rate to the arrival rate of vehicles in your parking lot. I think where we are a little behind in the world is with highway fast charge infrastructure. What I'm a little bit worried about is I think while it's important, there's almost an over-rotation on it. <clears throat> so we may actually see ourselves in an overbuild situation in let 10 me, years. Let me get into the, uh, the world that we're moving toward, because I'm working on a book about this. The eventual car that I think we'll all be riding in will be autonomous, electric, and connected. Right. Those are the three pillars. And I think that combination changes everything about what we know about cars today, how we buy them, how we store them, how we uh, collect them. I don't think we're going to be owning cars in the future. Um, can you talk about that? Uh, the world you see, you and I talked about this before, but uh, you see that we're really moving towards a total change in the car environment. So I think that the last speaker, I think, got into this a little bit. You can answer that question by zooming back. We're moving into a universe that is going to dramatically drop the cost of living for a human being because of the electrification of transportation of goods and people and autonomous drive dropping the need to own a car eventually. And, and that phases in over time. So if you have a family with more than one car, as more goes to a ride hailing service that's autonomous because the price points of ride hailing services that are autonomous can go to 16 cents a mile and, and then drop from there. And the minute that that's in force, it's cheaper than owning your own vehicle if you fully account for fuel maintenance, the flight financing of the vehicle, insurance, and all the other factors. So we're going to actually make you less sensitive to the amount of time you're being transported, make traffic far more manageable because it's now an autonomous coordinated system, um, reduce the cost of goods because supply chain motion of especially low cost commodities, transportation costs heavily feed factors into the cost of those goods. So we're actually going to solve a lot of problems besides the environment by electrifying transportation. We're also going to reduce the size of the vehicle fleet. Assuming that people don't own cars, which to me is the preferred model, we're talking about reducing the auto uh, fleet by something like 30 to 40 percent and also taking all the land that is now devoted to parking and uh, turning it into other public uses, which I think is a very good thing. And cars that we do keep will be on the road all the time, so they don't need to be parked. That's, it's, they're essentially like taxis now, which don't spend a lot of downtime. That's a big change, isn't it? I think it's a great change, though. I mean, I think, though, that starts to drop the cost of living in other ways. Um, you know, re when you decompress a real estate market, now you're changing, you know, the cost of living for housing. Um, you, 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 you make commuting patterns uh, different. Where you can go on vacation is now different. Imagine getting in an overnight pod. In fact, uh, I've, I've read an interesting article from the, the CEO of Airstream a while ago. Thinks that, you know, coach building is going to become the dominant art in, uh, in autonomous uh, or one of the dominant arts in autonomous transportation. I kind of agree with him in that, um, you know, don't think of it as a car like you currently see a car because now you're in a passenger compartment and you're not worried about being able to take control of the vehicle. So the right. minute you do that, overnight transportation to, if you live where I live in California, to the Grand Canyon for breakfast the next day and be back at work on Monday is totally feasible. We're moving to a very positive future in transportation. Uh, we have a question from the great, uh, internet sphere out there. They want to know uh, about wireless charging. Mm. And uh, I know I've talked to you about this and you were somewhat skeptical about it as part of public charging. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I think it's an important technology for um, if, you have, if you have access to off-street parking at home, uh, it can be a nice, a nice technology. Uh, for public charging in cities with in, you know, bad weather in general that have to have snow removal or, um, you know, you have to, you're going to have to bury that wireless infrastructure. And the minute you do that, it's an expensive installation and you're still going to need a cable charger in that same parking space because not all cars are going to have wireless charging until there's a standard and that's, that's a ways away. Oh, in other away. words, you couldn't have an outdoors wireless charging space 
because it would get covered with snow or rain or whatever. Yeah, I mean, water is something that, um, it, you know, is a problem, you know, for a wireless charging system, yeah. but snow removal is There's also an problem. inherent loss of about 10% that I understand. Right. But are you looking at that? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we look at wireless as a different cable, right? It's a different interface mechanism to the vehicle. It doesn't change the power electronics that much. It doesn't change the software problem. Our, our biggest value add is not that hardware. We don't really care what that is. What we care about is, from a driver perspective, how we make it easy to find, access, pay for stations, deal with the energy management problem at depots and parking spaces, uh, you know, uh, just all of the software problems associated with managing the charging ecosystem. So well, I think wireless is actually going to be pretty important for delivery fleets. One of the things we're seeing is the vehicles that are being introduced now have longer and longer ranges larger and larger battery packs, but we're seeing ranges in the like 250 miles, 260 mile range. So does that give the consumer a lot more confidence about owning an electric vehicle? Yeah, I mean, what I always ask people when I get that question is, you know, go ask your friends that own a Tesla whether they think they have enough range or not. I've never met one that says no. Um, and so uh, it actually, the knock on to that is that batteries really don't need to get a lot bigger from a capacity standpoint, they need to get cheaper and weigh less. And so if you yeah. take a, say, a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack in a luxury vehicle like a Tesla Model S, if you made it half the weight, the car would go further on that same 100 kilowatt oh, right, hours, yeah. right? So you get some positive benefit from that as well and a lot, a, lot, a lot of cost reduction. We only have about a minute left. I was gonna ask you, because we got into this earlier, uh, you're looking at charging airplanes vertical takeoff and landing, yeah. airplanes, ride sharing, possibly autonomous. We had a presentation on that in this very space a couple hours ago. Uh, you, you see that as part of your business model in the future? Yeah, I mean, we have to, uh, as we move uh, a lot, not move focus, but add focus to fleets, that's just another kind of fleet. And the reason we think it's important is that um, in congested cities, it provides an important option for cross town or medium haul flights. And if you look at the technology there, there, the better analogy is not the aircraft industry, it's the automotive industry, because aircraft are not very high volume, but these aircraft mm. could be reasonably high volume. So you could start to see cost structures in those aircraft that are it's not that much different. It's essentially ride sharing in the air. Yeah. Uber or Lyft or whatever in the air. Yeah. And so it's not that far from what we're doing with cars now. Right, and Uber's talking about getting a cost structure you know, within 10 years down to what UberX costs you now. Well, uh, we're out of time. Thank you, Pasquale Romano. That was Thank great. You. Thank you.